This is lecture 17 of ECE 5312. So, this is going to be the continuation of lecture from, uh, 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 for this. And what happens is, what we've done, talked about how we characterize our decision rule as a Gaussian random variable. So there's some sort of random aspect of, uh, of, of our decision rule. And then we turn it into a probability. So let me bring that up. And I know no one can see it except me. <laughs> so let's show everyone. So in last class, what we saw was this. So we, we, we basically went from a decision rule to something where we have the energy of one of the signals. So let's say we transmitted S1. And so the energy of S1 minus the correlation between S1 and S2 is E, as we saw, is Gaussian. This guy is Gaussian with zero mean and some variance, sigma squared. And we saw what sigma squared is equal to. That's equal to N naught E1, or yeah, sorry, um, E1, E2. So they're, they're equal minus rho 1, 2, right? And so remember, from probability, so the classic probability question is, what is the probability that my random variable okay, produces a value that is greater than or equal to some deterministic dummy variable? So that's deterministic. And how does this look like graphically? So for instance, if this is a Gaussian, what we've got is, here's our Gaussian. Suppose z is there, little z. What this means is, what is the probability that my black box here, z, big z, produces a value that's greater than or equal to this little dummy variable, little z? And that's characterized by the area underneath this curve all the way to plus infinity. Right? And we saw how the Q function can express this because, in fact, we're dealing with Gaussian random variables. Okay? So what we're going to do in this class is we're going to build upon that concept. Okay? So again, it sounds negative. The probability of error, not the probability of correct transmission. Otherwise, the numbers would be humongous. Right? So we want to deal instead with probability of error. And what we want to do is just like the premise of what we've been doing, like these expressions, the premise is S1 was transmitted, right? But I don't care about the probability of error when S1 is transmitted. Imagine you go to your boss. So suppose you work at AT&T or, or Verizon or Sprint or one of these companies, and they say, what is the error performance? And you respond, well, if you transmit S1, the error performance is this. He won't care. He'll say, what's S1? No, no. Very simple, right? What is the overall performance of S1? All S's. So what you want to do is ultimately, we find out what the probability of error is given we transmit one type of signal. Then we calculate for all possible of those, uh, the probability of error for every one of those transmitted signals, and then we average them out, right? So that last step, remember, okay, so this guy here, so this is the expression for the CDF, right? Cumulative distribution function. And that is equal to when the probability of the random variable x producing a value that's less than or equal to some deterministic little, val little x. And that is the integral from minus infinity to x. So, so, what, so how does a CDF of a Gaussian look like? Now, is your CDF accumulates, 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 accumulates. It does that. Happens is at every point. So let's say I arbitrarily. Yeah, it looks confusing. I'm sorry, folks. So let's let's do this. Much better. I think so. Right. No, not the pink line. Okay. What we'll do is 
Ah, yes, much better. So what, so what we do is that line there. How do you get the CDF at that point? What you do is you integrate underneath the curve all the way up to that point, and that determines that value. How about this point? Everything under the curve up to that point, and so on and so forth. So what happens is you accumulate from minus infinity all the way to whatever z is, right? And that's represented by fx of x, which is equal to the probability that my black box, my random variable x, produces a value that's less than or equal to little x. Now, going back to our original derivation. What happens is we have instead a random variable, and we're wondering it's producing a value that's greater than or equal to that value. So it's going to be sort of a complement of the CDF. So that's So what we want to do is, as it turns out, is if we write it like that, so it produces a value. So we have this integral expression. And again, let's make the jump. How do we make the jump from here to here? Well, what happens is, remember how the Q function is written, right? So it's x to plus infinity, and then it's 1 over the square root of 2 pi, e to the minus x squared divided by 2 dz, dz, right, or dx, sorry. So the problem here is we have a sigma squared that's in there. The way to handle it is you do a change of variables. You let y equal, well, let's, let's do that. Oh, I love using this white thing. Every, everyone everyone's probably knows that by now. I really, if I can have one Christmas gift, it would be having one of these at home. Forget like, you know, PlayStations and stuff like that. So, okay, so Q function, what's the definition? 1 over square root 2 pi, x to plus infinity, and then e to the minus t squared over 2 dt. Correct? Is that right? Okay, good. Now, what do we have in terms of our probability of error, right? So we have this guy, and then it's e minus rho 1, 2. And so what we've got, if we do this correctly, is plus infinity, 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus um, x squared 2 sigma squared dx. Correct? So what you do, change of variables, change of variables, what you do is let y, hmm, let y equal x divided by sigma. Is that right? Okay. Well, let's let's work it out, and if I'm wrong. <laughs> which won't be a surprise. Well, but, but what happens is, let's say we do the change of variables. So let's say, let's bring this guy up. How would he look like now? Oh, that's going to be minus y squared divided by 2, right? Um, the other thing is um, this guy here. How do we handle him? So we have to take the derivative of both sides. So this guy, so in this case, uh, d x is going to be equal to sigma dy, right? So what happens is we plug that in here, and notice that this guy here is actually sigma. They will actually cancel out. The last thing, people, people don't like this notation, but I'm going, to, I'm going to draw it. So let's say we get, so let's, let's make it big. So here's my integral. So people should see I have 2 pi, I have sigma, I have e to the minus y squared over 2. I also have sigma dy. So these go. 
right? Now, people don't usually use this notation, but it, it's, it's it really helpful, especially in these situations. What happens is here, this is little x is equal to sigma. And that's little x equals to that. So wh what we're doing is these are sort of the limits of the integration, and they're equal to x. All values of x. So now we replace those guys with what y is equal to. And y, uh, so x, so another thing is x here is equal to sigma y. So if we go back here, now what happens is I have sigma y, and sigma y is equal to plus infinity, and is equal to e minus rho 1, 2. Interesting enough, let's, let's divide both sides here by sigma. What ends up happening is, well, this guy here, it doesn't matter. What's infinity divided by sigma? It's still infinity. And this guy here, this guy here now becomes divided by sigma. This guy is now of the form of the Q function. So that's the argument for the Q function. E minus rho 1, 2 divided by sigma. Now we play a little bit of a trick. We now do the square root of the square of these arguments. And what we see is that this guy, in fact, here, that's our n naught over 2, correct? Or is it n naught? Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 sorry. Got it. Thanks. Do, 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 do. Thank you. So it should be replaced. Okay. Should be replaced by n naught e minus rho 1, 2. Ah. So the square goes, that goes. And so magically, what we get at the end of the day is e minus rho 1, 2 over n naught. Beautiful. Okay, so given that, and we go back to the overhead projector here. How do we minimize the probability of error? So assuming that the energies are all the same, we don't have much control over that. Assuming we don't have superhuman powers, we can't control the noise, right? Like. Imagine if I could, um, essentially, like, you know, let's say I want to transmit a signal, right? And I say, silence! And what happens is all the noise goes down and I transmit my signal. Oh, I would love that. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> but no, unfortunately, I can't do that. So what instead I do is the only thing I have left in my arsenal is, assuming that all signals have the same energy, I try and make them as anti-correlated as possible. I try to make this guy as positive a value. And remember, what is the cor this correlation coefficient doing? Essentially, it ranges between minus 1 and 1, right? So I want this guy to be as negative as possible, right? So what we do is we try and, and, we try and strive for that. What ends up happening is intuitively, what's the best choice? It's when we have signals that are anti-correlated with each other, right? So for instance, remember BPSK? Remember some BPSKs work better than others. And there were a number of reasons. So intuition, like let's look at this. So we saw this several times before. In terms of Euclidean distance, like we need to make a decision, right? If we have noise, we want these guys as far away from each other as possible. So check out the guy in the bottom left-hand corner. That's also BPPS, that's BPSK, but it's at a 90 degree angle, which means S1 and S2, their heads are closer to each other than, let's say, the middle guy here, which are antipodal. These guys are as anti-correlated as you can be. On the other hand, this, uh-uh, not uncorrelated enough, not anti-correlated enough. And what we saw, remember before, we talked about power efficiency. When you look at error performance, and you have that sucker there, 
when they're 90 degrees separated instead of 180 degrees separated, it turns out we have a 3D loss in error probability. Right? What do I mean by 3db loss? I mean our error, um, error doubled, okay? Because they are this instead of that, right? Because why? What happens is, what happens when they're 90 degrees? Zero. Row one, two, zero. This is minus something. So E minus minus, in this case, I said one, but in fact, that, that's if the correlation coefficient is normalized. If it's not normalized, in this case, when they're antipodal, it will be minus their energy. Minus, minus the energy is plus the energy. We like put twice the amount of energy. Q function gets smaller. Ah, yeah. When we do that, And if you guys, this is exercise for a student, EFTS, do this exact same thing for when we transmit zero, which means we transmit S2 in the signal, and we have a decision statistic, and we calculate the Z, or Z, if you're in England, and then what happens is you find that when you average the two together. So basically, what is the probability of transmitting a one? What is the probability of transmitting a zero? Find their conditional probabilities of error and add them together, and you'll get that beautiful expression. So here what happens is we make the assumption that the energies are equal, but when they're not equal, we, what happens is the numerator in that Q function can be replaced by the Euclidean distance, d min squared. Okay, so when we don't have equal energy, we replace that beautiful expression for energy in the numerator by d min squared. Ah, so you get this thing here. So when we have equal energy, we have squared is what we use. Now, as we'll see, okay. So the the la uh, so not this lecture. So lecture eighteen. We're going to look at something called, like, the, I kind of goofed in the last lecture, but lecture 18, the big thing we're going to look at is error bounds, right? And what we're going to find out, we want to find sort of what is the likelihood of the probability of error. What we do, just like what we did with power efficiency, is we look for the folks that are closest together, right? And so what we're going to look at is we want to find out Again, the, the, the two sig the signal constellation points, the pair of signal constellation points that are closest together will most likely cause error, right? There's not enough separation between the two. So, this is where we go into the fun stuff. So if you have more than one symbol, you care about uh, if you're transmitting <sighs> So the, the so okay so the question is, um, when we have multiple signals, when we have multiple signals, do we care about um, the signal constellation points that are closest together compared to everyone else? And the answer is yes, because what happens is, oh, what happens is the following: the um, sadly, the um, the uh, um, the Q function actually the the if you, it's not a linear relationship between the input argument and the Q function. In fact, it's very drastic. So what happens is sort of like a, a slight difference in that D min between two points compared to every other pairing of points could spell like a humongous difference in the probability of error. What happens is it could even be like an order of magnitude difference. So what, 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 do we, what, what do we call that situation? We basically say that pair dominates the error probability. So what's really cool is right now I'm going through this rigorous math and everybody's like yawning and saying, oh my god, all this probability, all these numbers. Well, what happens is then you guys are going to get very comfortable in terms of making some assumptions. That's actually what the next lecture, lecture 18, is about. It starts making you think like in terms of where can I cut corners? 
Like, for instance, we talked about the double frequency terms when we calculated waveforms and we have, you know, double the frequency. Well, we can approximate it as zero, right? And how did that simplify to math? Oh, simplified it a lot, right? And here what we'll find is that when we look at a very large scale signal constellation, those pairings that are closest together relative to every other pairing, like let's say you have three points, right? And the ones that are separated by hypotenuse, forget it. They're already like, that's like way smaller. They're way too far away. Their error probability is going to be way smaller than this pairwise error probability or that pairwise error probability if they're close together. The hypotenuse out of the triangle that I made um, already puts them in a different category. They're way smaller and, we, and you can neglect it, right? And so when we do um, error bounds, we use these assumptions. We say, we, like, like, you know, do you need to have this precision down to like five or six decimal places? No. Just like roughly, what is the error probability of the situation? So you can do some shortcuts. But in theory, signal in many of the other signals. So if it's already produced errors, to go to this one or to this one is equal. Yeah, no, okay. So the, the question is like, if you have the, uh, like, so l let me draw it. So, so essentially, so let's say I have this signal that signal, and then let's say I have, ah, uh, thank you, you're blind, okay, so let's see, we have, like, this guy here, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, uh, you know, I just get so caught up in this, so, so what happens is, let's say I have the following, this is exactly what I was drawing with my hand, okay, so what happens is, we look at the, the distance between these two guys, we look at the distance between these two guys, and they're equal, so let's say we call that 1, we call that 2, and then the distance here, 3, is actually way farther. What will turn out is, let's say you take the D here, so let's say that's 1, so, uh, no, sorry, A, B, C. So D, A, B is one distance, D, B, C is another one, and D, A, C is another one. What happens is, if you plug that into this Q function, so D, whatever, X, Y squared divided by and not, I believe. What happens is, if you put that in, that even though this is a sm this guy here is relatively a little bit longer than this guy or that guy, it's actually enough to knock this guy an order of magnitude smaller than the other two pairings. So what happens is, then let's say you do the average of, or let's say, like you know, of these errors, you can quickly say. To simplify things, let's forget about the small guys. Let's only look at what dominates the error probability. Okay? Excellent question. Excellent question. Ah. So actually going back, let's 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 do this. Constellation diagram. So let's say we have here's our origin. And this guy here. is S1 the vector, and that's S2 the vector. There's a, re there's a method behind my madness for introducing things in the vector format. Because what happens is this gives us what we call the error vector diagram. Error vector diagram. And what do I mean to say by that? Well, what happens is suppose that noise is added, right, to, to S1. That's noise vector. And that results in R. Just like I mentioned before, when radios operate, they cannot, you cannot give them qual qualitative things. Like, oh, it needs to be to me than to you. Or how much sim more similar does this look to, to, to this signal than to that waveform? What happens is it's all got to be math, right? So with linear algebra, what do you do in this case? What well, we'll see, so I'm, I'm sort of jumping the gun by maybe almost an entire lecture. What happens is, what you want to do is you want to sort of translate the distance of R with S1 and the distance of R with S2 and say, who is smaller? That's the big question.
basically, who's closer? Is R, R closer to S1 or S2? So how do you do that? Well, you can do things like R, the norm, right? Minus S1. So this is vector subtraction. And is it, um, oh, sorry. Is it less than or equal to R minus S2 vector subtraction, right? So this tells me who's closer. But we can take this one step more, right, as we'll see. So for instance, so if we go back to the doc cam, this diagram. But what's really interesting is there's this other one I draw here. And this is going to, I'm going to basically harp on this all through lecture 18. So brace yourself. I'm just going to be talking about this one vector here throughout lecture 18. Oh, you, on a Wednesday night, this is what everyone needs, right? Well, what happens is we're going to use this as our baseline. What happens is we're going to use it as, OK, we have this vector, S1, J. So it could be J could be 2, 3, 4, 5. We do this with every pairing of Signal, con uh, signal constellation points, right? What it represents is this line here is the sort of absolute distance between S1 and SJ. And what we want to do is project the noise onto it. So what, so like what will happen is, suppose we have noise. Suppose we have noise, and it displaces S1 that's transmitted by some amount. What would signify an error here is when the noise displaces S1 so much that it becomes closer to SJ than S1. How does this look like from a one-dimensional perspective? Why did I choose one-dimensional? Complexity. I just have one thing to worry about is this line. And what I care about is projecting the noise down onto this line. Is it? Does the noise push this over the halfway mark towards SJ? Or does the noise still keep this guy still within S1's realm? OK? That's, that's the beauty of it. So the complexity issue is one dimensional. I project the noise down onto this one dimensional space. And it's a very simple threshold. Is it above the halfway mark or below it? And it's error or not? Beautiful. So that's exactly what I have written here in lecture, in, in, in the sixth slide here, which essentially is we have, we call, let's say S1 is our reference vector, because S1 is what's transmitted, and SJ is some other signal constellation point. What S, what delta S J means? It's the vector that is the vector subtraction of S J from S one, and it's normalized by delta one J. Sorry, not delta D one J. So what am I doing? I'm basically making some sort of unit vector in the direction of or from S one to S J, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to project the noise onto it, and if the noise is more than half of the distance between S1 and SJ, we've got an error. Ah, and that's what we've got here. So that squiggly E, J, that is the error situation between S1, that's transmitted, and SJ, which was not transmitted. And what you'll see is we're going to scale this for all E's, all error conditions. So what we're going to look at is every pairwise error probability between S1 and every S out there, except with S1 because it's with itself. Doesn't make sense. And so what we want to do is our error event is what's in the bracket here. Project the noise down onto this unit vector that heads in this direction. And if it's more than halfway there, to SJ, it's an error. And then what we do is we will develop in the next lecture, in lecture 18, a bound 
several bounds that build upon it. Because the thing is, we will try, I forgot which lecture it is, we will try to come up with sort of an n-dimensional error probability, not pairwise, n-dimensional, and it is intense. And we're, we'll make a lot of simplifying assumptions. If you think this is a lot of probability, wait until I do that. Ah, but if we keep everything pairwise, this gives us some flexibility. We can solve easily, right? Pairwise is easy. It's trivial. It's just one dimension, not n-dimensional. And then we just have to look at all pairs. Okay? Okay. So that um, concludes uh, lecture 17. So, okay, we're doing well. Only a few people are sleeping. No, just kidding. <laughs>